right. I have the unenviable task of following Alan and his uh, eloquent uh, comments. I don't have the accent, I don't have the economic <laughs> background. Um, and I'm going to talk about a, a history of Canadian cultural policy, so please try to stay awake. Um, I, what I, what I, when, when we were talking about how we were going to present this, I thought maybe if Alan talked about the, the worldview and, and the opportunities, that maybe I should bring it back to some practical realities and um, talk about what cultural policies exist uh, in Canada, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, and, and kind of give you a background and understanding of, of what, where they came from and what they talked about. But just quickly before I do, I want to I say um, two things. Uh, Peter Herndorf, who some of you may know, is the National Director of the National Arts Centre, and he recently gave a, a speech to some Chamber of Commerce folks, and, and he pulled out a couple of great things. And, and it was to do with brand, and, and um, MIT in Boston uh, undertook a survey of a number of countries across Canada, and they asked people who were the best known citizens from different countries. And Canada was the only country in the survey who all those 10 were artists. So it just says, what, what are we known for around the world? And I, I bet if you thought about who are the best known Manitobans, you might come up with, with artists as well. Um, and then Peter Herdendorf went on to talk about brands and, and said, all countries have brands. The Canadian brand has historically been about nature. And to change the perception of Canada to that of a cultural powerhouse is critically important. So these are conversations that are going on across the world, or across the country, and across the world, that, that Canada and Manitoba is particularly creatively endowed in a, in a very creative country. And um, so I just want to now uh, give you kind of a, a quick snapshot of, you know, artists provide a glimpse into the soul of a nation or into a soul of people, but they do a lot of practical work as well. They enhance cognitive development in kids, they stimulate creativity in young people, they contribute to strong and healthy communities, they're vital to the creative economy. Um, so these are all sort of things to think about when we start talking about policy because policy is, is what shapes how we use the resources that we have. Now, let's jump back to 1944, post-war Canada, or almost post-war Canada, and 15 arts organizations got together in Toronto and said, we need to advocate for the arts, artists of all disciplines in Canada. We have no formal body to, to do anything. And within a year, the federal government had established something that was called, uh, well, the, the, this coalition of groups put together a brief concerning the cultural aspects of Canadian reconstruction. So it was about what does Canada look like in the post-war era. And this report led to, uh, in 1945, the establishment of the Canada Arts Council, which became the Canada Conference for the Arts. And Sam and I were just talking about the fact that this was the longest serving arts body in Canada, and it was shut down by Stephen Harper a few years ago. The role of the Canada Conference for the Arts was to advise Canadian heritage on matters regarding arts and culture, um, and how the Canadian federal government policy should be developed. Harper had said, no, we don't need to know that, we'll figure it out ourselves. So, anyways, we're going to jump ahead to 1949. There was something called the Massey-Levesque uh, Commission. It was a Royal Commission on the Arts. It went across the country. It spoke to hundreds of people. It was thousands of pages to wade through. And really, it's the formative document for Canadian cultural policy. It uh, set the tone for radio and television policy. It uh, increased funding in the mandate of CBC. It uh, established the Canada Council for the Arts as one of its recommendations. It established a national library, archival heritage policies, and um, these are these are the, the four key points that were recommended coming out of the Massey Levesque Royal Commission. The first was increasing the public's access to art. So your argument about the public should be art is not an elite thing has been discussed for years. There was a, a discussion about prioritizing cultural expression of Indigenous Canada, and it wasn't talking about Aboriginal peoples, it was talking about art created by Canadians. Uh, it was talking about improving the economic circumstances of artists, 
And the last point was promoting a tri-level, federal, provincial, municipal model of public support for culture. So really what they came out of it and said is the government's role, not just the federal government, but it is all government's role to support art and culture in Canada. Why did they do this? Well, a part of it was that we were having this burgeoning sense of identity. We had done well in the wars, we had acquitted ourselves on an international stage, and now we were also in fear of being overpowered by the U.S. And, and there needed to be some way to identify who we were as Canadians and make sure that Canadian art and artists were represented and represented ourselves to the world. Um, so we're now going to jump ahead. 1956, governments can't do anything quickly. So from 1949, when the recommendations were made, to 1956, the Canada Council for the Arts was established, and that was the formal funding body that we still know today. Now, Manitoba came to the table a little bit later. We were one of the, the, the later provinces to adapt the funding body, and the Manitoba Arts Council was formed in 1965, and its mandate was to promote the study, enjoyment, production and performance of works in the arts. And then in 1984, the Winnipeg City Council said, well, we should be doing something too. They established what was called the Winnipeg Arts Advisory Council, and that was to assess what role the city should play in funding arts organizations and what kind of arts and cultural policy should they have. It wasn't until 2002 that Winnipeg formally established the Winnipeg Arts Council as an arm's length incorporated body. And the mandate that the, the Winnipeg Arts Council was funded, formed under was, as a preeminent city building organization, the Winnipeg Arts Council focuses on the quality of life in the city and how arts and culture determines Winnipeg's reputation as a city of the arts, both nationally and internationally. So you see a bit of a trend here that cultural policy, cultural funding bodies at three levels of government were established so that people could create art, could enjoy art, and that we could become known for our art. Uh, then, um, we, we've established this tri-level funding model. So who gets what money and how does it work? Uh, what ended up happening was is that the, the civic or municipal funder along with the provincial funder, tended to be the first in on any sort of a project. Those were the people who came. So what ended up happening was the level of federal dollars becomes dependent on the municipal investment and the provincial investment. Okay? So you've got three levels of government funding. You've got a complex form of who funds what. And, um, and, and, and it's impacted by the amount that the local governments start by, by investing in. Winnipeg is uh, one of the lower cities, tends to have a lower investment, so sometimes we're leaving federal dollars on the table if you can look at it that way, compared to cities such as uh, Edmonton or Toronto or Vancouver who invest more per capita. That was the art side of things. In the early 1980s, it started to become something called the cultural industries, and there was a revolution of, of um, mass market products, so film, uh, television, music, book publishing, uh, became something that people could make money at, that, that um, governments went, wait a minute, we should be investing in this because this is good for our economy. And, and the mandate for funding art changed. They still had the arts councils, but they created new streams of funding. So in 1987, uh, what was called the Cultural Industry Development Office, it was a federal provincial joint initiative that funded film and music. Um, this was a, was a new thing, it was, it was different from what had gone on before, and it was complementary to the Arts Councils, but separate. It was new funds of revenue. After three years, the federal government pulled out and it became uh, what's known now as Manitoba Film and Sound. And uh, what, what happened was there was federal, federal funding agencies factor in the music, there was the Canadian Television Fund, there was a number of different organizations that started to fund the cultural industries, federally, provincially. There is really no civic body. There, there is a, a special events and film commission at the city of Winnipeg that does things like closes streets for films and things, but they don't necessarily fund it. But the curious thing that happened was is that it created a divide. It said, okay, you people over there, you're making content. You're making commercial art. You people over here funded by the arts councils are making art. 
and the language that you use in your applications is separate, it's different, you're doing it for different reasons, the governments are funding it for different reasons. So you, you're adding three levels of government, you've got this complex funding formula, now you've got content over here and art over here. So we're, we're, we're building this incredibly complex funding system to kind of weave your way through and figure it out, and there's different mandates uh, for why the funding is, is granted. The other thing that's happening is, is that you've got the art side of the art world creating infrastructure and systems to support their art, and over here you've got the commercialized side, and there's a gulf. Um, it's especially evident in Winnipeg in the film community where you see agencies that are established to create art film, and they've got in infrastructure, and then there's the commercial side, and they've got their infrastructure, and they, they don't work together, which is unfortunately in my view. Um, so, you have all this complexity in cultural policy, different mandates, why do you support it, why don't you support this, and then digital technology happened. Digital technology came along and, and blew everything up. It fundamentally changed how art is produced, how it's consumed, how it's disseminated, it changed who creates it and who's the audience, it blurred the lines of professional artists, um, and it, it, it just, it sort of mixed everything up. The other thing that it did was it toppled the business models. So I'll give you a, a quick sidebar. Um, I worked with the Crash Test Dummies and earned royalties from, from the sales of their first record. And if you look at the percentage, it's a, it's a complex funding formula that the record companies have, but you can say 1% of sales um, would equal approximately 8 to 12 cents per album sold. Albums don't get sold anymore, you get downloads. Very few of those are legitimate, but the legitimate downloads that are sold, that 10 cents, 8 to 12 cents per album is now equated to one song download on iTunes which pays .0004025 cents per download. So if you think about the math on that and you do the economics, it all of a sudden makes it very difficult for a recording artist to make any money especially since they're, uh, they're, they're not being compensated for probably 90% of the downloads. There's an argument that said there's more touring, there's more live performance opportunities, and so there are opportunities. So it's not all doom and gloom, but the major record companies who are in many ways the bank for the cultural industries are no longer the bank. So, so it, it, it's business models have changed. So um, to conclude, I just want to say that if we're going to realize the kind of policy changes that we need to have with Alan, we have to wade through an incredibly complex set of established cultural policies that have been developed in an ad hoc manner. Nothing has been done in the sort of, uh, well, here's the creative sector, how are we going to make sure that all the different pieces work together? Um, it's, it's been done in response to, uh, to uh, perceived opportunities or perceived threats, it's been influenced by interest groups, but it hasn't been done comprehensively. So what we really need to do is pull together a very diverse group of people and a diverse group of organizations and a diverse group of mandates and try to come up with a policy that we can work together on. But we're a creative place, we can do it. Great. Here we go. Thank you very much.